You know, I, in, in a lot of the work that you did and, and you were able to establish, you know, your foundation, could you, um, uh, we have, uh, people that are in the chat that want to ask questions, but before they do, I just wanted to, uh, have you talk a little bit about what it was like for you to come forward at that time. And then the organization that you founded as a result. Oh, thanks Tara. Yeah. It, um, a lot of people ask me when I like St. Paul, I, when I fell off my horse, you know, when I, <laughs> Light about the best, the best maybe strong. in my view you got on a horse and and rode to to as a hero so depends on your perspective yeah actually it's it's not a really good analogy to what happened uh yeah. if people don't know that truman who set up the cia set it up for one primary purpose and that was he wanted one organization responsive to him alone, not to the Pentagon or not to the State Department, to whom he could go and say, I want you to tell me straight what's going on here in Russia, what's going on here in China, okay? Mm -hmm. I control your career. Give it to me straight. Whoa. Mm -hmm. Truman talked about untreated intelligence. That's what he wanted. No values attached to it. He wanted to know what was going on in the world. That's what attracted me to working in the CIA. That was the analysis division. Now, after the war, Tara, this would be kind of interesting for you to know, perhaps. The war, I was alive during the war. Uh, I was quite little. But after World War II, uh, these very, very brave, and courageous, and just really enterprising people came back from the OSS, the Office of Strategic Services, the forerunner to the CIA. They had jumped in behind enemy lines. They had overthrown government. They had done all kinds of really, really sexy things. And they came and everybody in Washington clapped. And then they said, that, thanks very much. Uh, you want us to stay around? I mean, you, you got work for us? Now, the muckety mucks in those days, George Kennan among them said, of course, of course they are. Don't go back to your to your universities or your law firms or your corporations. No, stay here because the Russians are doing all kinds of stuff. They are overthrowing governments. They are assassinating people. They are doing all kinds. Of, we have to be able to do that too. Okay, so they're going to stay around. Then the question came, where do we put these guys? I mean, like uh, we can't have a, we can't have an agency for overthrowing governments or even for regime change. <laughs> oh, I know what to do. We'll put them together with the analyst division in CIA, and it'll be just one happy family because the analyst division will have spies telling them information that they need to do analysis with. The covert action people will do all kinds of other stuff. But they'll be on the one head, and it'll be just really great. It was a big, big. Well, it was a, it was a structural fault from the beginning. You can't have one person being responsible for overthrowing governments, and another, per, and that same person being responsible for telling the president, "Hey, Mr. President, this is a stupid idea. You don't overthrow this government because this, this, and this is going to happen." Or you don't blow up this pipeline, Mr. President, because this, this, and this is going to happen. So what I'm saying here is there are two CIAs. The one I worked in, especially on the Soviet account, I was I have a graduate degree in Russian studies. You should teach Russian. Um, we were able to pretty much tell it like it was, like it is, until Bill Casey and Bobby Gates came in, early 80s. Then, it, then the Soviet analysis went down too. But during the period from 1963, when I entered the agency, little about, well, I was able to tell it like it is to my briefees when I was briefing the president's daily brief downtown for the first four years of the Reagan administration, a president's daily brief. So it was really good duty and we could tell it like it was. Uh, and, and now it's, it's kind of, now it's corrupted. So the long answer to your question is uh, when I retired, uh, I retired as early as I could. Um, it was early 
1990, the Berlin Wall had just fallen down. Uh, George H.W. Bush was saying, look, why can't we just get along here? Let's get along with Russia. Uh, let's let's create a, a strategic situation where we'll have peace and prosperity from Lisbon to Vladivostok. Oh, man. I thought that was so great. All the more so since I had briefed Vice President Bush every other morning and had worked for him when he was head of the CIA. I patted myself on the back and said, Ray, the Soviet Union has fallen apart. You can go in peace to work downtown. I wanted to work downtown in a... Uh, a uh, nonprofit that I had been volunteering with. So that was 1990. And then all of a sudden, 1998, 1999, and 2000, when Bush comes in, the, the small Bush, the little Bush, uh, junior Bush, all of a the sudden, George w. Mm -hmm. my, my former colleagues uh, falsifying intelligence to justify a war of aggression. I mean, it doesn't get any worse than that, okay? So um, a few a few of my colleagues thought, uh, as I did, that, you know, this can't, we got to do something. We have the expertise. We, we have a fancy new way to communicate. It's called something like email or so, you know, and we can give each other sanity checks. When we, when I write something that says uh, Vice President Cheney is lying through his teeth, you know, I like to, you can't go to the next cubicle anymore and get your own, but you could do email, right? right? So what happened was we formed we formed our little group called the Veteran Intelligence Professionals for Sanity, okay? Sanity of which there was not an abundance in Washington at the time. And the sanity to, re to remind ourselves that, you know, we got to give each other sanity checks we think we know what's going on, but the collective expertise of this collegial body you know, can can tell the president uh, better than just one individual. And we wrote our first memo on the very afternoon, right after Colin Powell spoke at the UN by mm -hmm. February 2003. And we told the president, this is, uh, this is a lot of what the British call rubbish. Uh, it certainly doesn't it doesn't uh, justify a war. I remember our last our last sentence. We said, Mr. President, we strongly advise you to widen the circle of your advisors beyond those clearly bent on a war for which we see no compelling reason and from which we believe the unintended consequences are likely to be catastrophic. You know, we take no pleasure in having been right about that. It was the worst thing I've seen. The United States did a war of aggression. I'll just finish by saying that there's a, that's a technical term, war of aggression, defined by Nuremberg as the supreme international crime, differing from other war crimes only insofar as it contains the accumulated evil of the whole. Accumulated evil, think torture. I guess yeah. I should figure and say, I should just say it. <laughs> so our mission became the same as it always was. And no falling off any horse on the way to Damascus. Tell the truth. And we got some real resonance for a couple of our first, uh, our first memos to the president. But since then, they shut us down. We still publish memos to the president. Some of them, we believe, get through but there's no indication that he takes them seriously and less still that he decides that he ought to follow our advice. That's, that's really, and, and, you know, um, I'm, I'm sure that people that don't know some of those details, I really appreciate kind of being, because, because again, we're having, we've had the wool pulled over our eyes with another, you know, endless war that actually is profiting some of the same companies, Lockheed Martin, TRW that is now gone, but you know, you have Raytheon and other ones. So